If it's Wednesday, it is debate night in America and the field versus the front runner. As eight Republican presidential candidates are faced with their biggest test yet. How to reckon with Donald Trump's grip on the race without him even on the stage. This is a Meet the Press special. Live from Washington, here's Chuck Todd. And welcome to the Meet the Press debate night special. The first Republican presidential debate is in the books. I'm Chuck Todd reporting from Washington. We've got a big hour of post-debate coverage and analysis, so let's hurry up and dive in. The major question going into this first debate was whether the eight candidates on stage could or would do something to change the basic pattern or trajectory of this race that so far been dominated by the frontrunner Donald Trump, who skipped tonight, citing his commanding lead. Well, with the debate wrapping up, it appears for now that the status quo probably will remain. No candidate on stage substantively changed their stance on the former president. Trump's name was actually barely mentioned by anyone in the entire first hour of the debate. And then this is how the second hour kicked off. You all signed a pledge to support the eventual Republican nominee. If former President Trump is convicted in a court of law, would you still support him as your party's choice? Please raise your hand if you would. Just hold on. Yeah, you saw that. It all sort of, first hand it pops up is Vivek. And then people start watching. And then DeSantis, then Pence. And yeah, we're confused by Chris Christie ourselves. But Ron DeSantis, the candidate currently closest to Trump in the polls, largely pulled his punch in when given the chance to draw a contrast with Trump. Here he is dodging a question tied to the events surrounding the January 6th insurrection when the vice president refused Trump's demands to interfere with the certification of the election. But Governor DeSantis, do you believe that Mike Pence did the right thing on January 6th? So here's what we need to do. We need to end the weaponization of these federal agents. But, but I will do that. That's not the question. I, I know, but here's the thing. You can answer this the question. election <laughs> is not about January 6th of 2021. It's about January 20th of 2025, when the next president is going to take office. I've, I've answered this before. So, yes. No, why are we... He, Mike, Mike did his duty. I got no beef with him. But here's the thing. Is this what we're going to be focusing on? I'm relieved. Going we forward, will. the yeah. rehashing of this? I'll yes. tell you, Governor the DeSantis. Democrats would love... Love that. So without Trump on stage, it was newcomer Vivek Ramaswamy, the Trump acolyte, who was a popular target all night. In many ways, he was perhaps the surrogate that everybody else thought they could use as a Trump punching bag on that stage. He took up Trump's defense, which the audience cheered as he sparred with Chris Christie on Trump's conduct. Here's the bottom line. Someone's got to stop normalizing this conduct. Okay? Now... And now, whether or not, whether or not you believe that the criminal charges are right or wrong, the conduct is beneath the office of President of the United States. And, and, and you know, this is the great thing about this country. Booing is allowed. But it doesn't change the truth. President Trump, I believe, was the best president of the 21st century. It's a fact. And Chris Christie, honest to God, your claim that Donald Trump is motivated by vengeance and grievance would be a lot more credible if your entire campaign were not based on vengeance and grievance against one man. And if people at home want to see a bunch of people blindly bashing Donald Trump without an iota of vision for this country. They could just change the channel to MSNBC right now. In fact, Ramaswamy's presence and the attention and ire he seemed to draw from everybody else on that stage was easily one of the bigger stories of the night. As the most Trump-like candidate, he seemed to suck up the oxygen on stage as he tried to capture the anti-establishment and anti-government screeds and grievances that first catapulted Trump to the top of the Republican field back in 2015. Here are some of the biggest hits of the field against Ramaswamy. Let us be honest as Republicans. I'm the only person on the stage who isn't bought and paid for, so I can say this. The climate change oh, agenda whoa, 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 whoa. is a That's hoax. Ridiculous. The climate is change ridiculous. agenda is a hoax. And we have to declare independence for it. And the reality is the anti-carbon agenda is the wet blanket on our economy. 
And so the reality is more people are dying of bad climate change policies than they are of actual climate uh, change. Governor, Governor right, Haley, are you bought and paid for? Hold on, hold on. Listen, look, listen, look, listen. I've had enough. No, Let, no, wait, no, hold no. on, hold I've on. I've had enough. I've had enough already tonight of a guy who sounds like ChatGPT standing up here. And the last person in one of these debates, Brett, who stood in the middle of the stage and said, What's a skinny guy with an odd last name doing up here was Barack Obama, and I'm afraid we're dealing with the same type of amateur well, standing on stage tonight. Come over and give me a hug. <laughs> give me a hug just same, like you did to Obama. The same type of amateur. And, and you'll help elect me just the, like you did to right, Obama, right, too. Right. Give me that the same hug, type of amateur. By the way, the top three candidates in the polls. It's not going to be too long for he rolls across a NATO border, and frankly, our men and women of our armed forces are going to have to go and fight him. I want to let the Ukrainians fight and drive Putin and the, and the Russians back out new, into I, Russia. I, I want to just so briefly address Pence. Have to make that Vice fight. President Pence. I have a newsflash. The USSR does not exist anymore. It fell back in 1990. Did I say the real USSR? threat? You talked about the communists. And the real communists that we have to address right now have any is the idea what I, I Putin's aims you, you already spoke. Now I actually have Vladimir Putin seconds. has been saying he wants to reestablish the old you, Soviet sphere You've made of your influence. point, Vice President. Vice President, now, President you Pence. Think, I'm sorry if I insulted him by calling him a communist. He is a dictator and a murderer. And the United States of America needs to stand against authoritarianism. And by the way, if you're keeping score at home, the top three candidates in the national polls right now in the Republican presidential primary, Donald Trump, Ron DeSantis, and Vivek Ramaswamy are all publicly right now against currently giving more funding for Ukraine in the war against Russia. Keep that in mind. I said it nationally because we know Tim Scott's in third in Iowa, and, and, and he is not on that. But the top three nationally. The other major takeaway from tonight, the greatest ire on stage wasn't directed at President Biden. He went through the night relatively unscathed, or even President Trump, but it was each other. Our NBC News team has every angle of the story covered. We've got reporters in the spin room, and we're talking to voters. My NBC colleague, Hallie Jackson, has been, is right here in the studio. She's been fact-checking the candidates. We're going to speak to a top official in the Trump campaign as well in a moment. And I've got a tremendous panel that I watched the debate with all night, and they're here to break it all down. So let's get everything started. Let's get to Milwaukee, where we've got Garrett Hake and Dasha Burns. They're in the spin room for us tonight. Garrett, let me start with you. Um, I can tell you this. I feel like there isn't a general consensus out there. Everybody's finding their moment that they think is what helped them. What are you hearing in the spin room? Yeah, I think that's right, Chuck. It won't surprise you to know here in the spin room, every candidate was a winner, including the one who wasn't here, Donald Trump. But I think the, the takeaway seems to be that Ramaswamy was kind of the conduit through which all these other candidates tried to do what they came here to do, including Ramaswamy, by the way. He was able to play the you know polarizing outsider, the Donald Trump 2016 role on that stage. And each candidate who really tried almost to line up to mix it up with him took their opportunity to mix it up with him on their preferred issue, whether it was Mike. Mike Pence on experience, Nikki mm -hmm. Haley on foreign policy, Chris Christie on just about everything. It was their opportunity to kind of exploit their own strengths and pick a fight with somebody who wasn't Donald Trump. You know, our polling has showed that going after Donald Trump aggressively has been a loser for these candidates among Republican voters in Iowa, for example. This is a way to show you're tough, pick a fight, but do it with somebody else. And so I think that's kind of the overarching story for now. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I think Ron DeSantis you know, I think his people are pleased that he was not dogpiled on. I think talking to some right. of the folks in his orbit before this debate got started, there was this concern that maybe it was going to be everybody goes at Ron DeSantis, and instead it was uh, Ramaswamy who got the dogpile, and DeSantis was able to pick his moment. So whether any of that fundamentally changes the direction of this race, I doubt. Uh, but DeSantis kind of stops the bleeding at least a little bit, and Ramaswamy becomes the new uh, villain for these other candidates to play off of going forward. No, it's fascinating. I'm going to be very curious to see if Ramaswamy is one of those that plays better with the audience than maybe he plays with the professional class. We shall see. Dasha Burns, um, I think it was notable how aggressive, I think about some of the people you've been traveling with. That was a very aggressive Mike Pence. Um, frankly, surprisingly so. That's not the Mike Pence we've gotten to know. He tried to, I think, uh, find a moment, whether he got one or not. We'll, we'll see later. And I agree with Garrett about 
what we saw with DeSantis. What are you hearing there on the ground, particularly from Team Pence? I'm curious what they think of what he did tonight. Yeah, Chuck, this was not necessarily the dynamic that we expected, right? The preamble was the dog pile was going to be on Ron DeSantis, that uh, folks like Mike Pence and Tim Scott were going to try to sort of hold the line and uh, be the bearers of standard conservatism. That's certainly what uh, I was told from the Pence team was the plan beforehand, although that's why it was surprising to see him come out um, so, so fiery and really take on Vivek Ramaswamy, who got the vast majority of attacks and also fired back. And, and, and through the vast majority of arrows. Uh, DeSantis, though, uh, not really taking the brunt of, of the attacks like mm -hmm. we expected and really sticking to the message. Look, a lot of what he talked about are things that we have heard on the campaign trail, but that's not necessarily a bad thing when you're talking to a national audience and a lot of voters who probably haven't really been tuning in until just now. And listen, I'll let you hear straight from the horse's mouth here. I've got with me uh, David Polianski, who is uh, fresh to the campaign, actually coming over from the Super PAC one week as deputy campaign manager. And I'll just give you a moment here, your quick reaction to what we saw tonight. Well, it's exactly what we hope for and more. Um, Governor DeSantis stepped to the, pay, the stage tonight and he delivered a, bit, a win, a win on the debate stage because he looked presidential, he acted presidential, more importantly, he painted a vision for the country that he will drive home as our next president and we couldn't be happier. The preamble was dogpile on Ron, that he was going to be the target of a lot of attacks. Is it a good thing that he wasn't attacked, or is there sort of that, you know, sometimes getting the majority of the attacks says, hey, I'm the front runner and I'm here, and I know he was prepared, as we all talked about, uh, to, to take those on. Well, look, um, this is a two-person race. The Des Moines Register poll in Iowa evidences that as well. And I think what you saw tonight was Governor DeSantis have clean air to drive his message for two hours, two hours of free time to deliver his message and explain uh, not only his vision for the country, but tell people a little bit about him. Um, and many folks haven't had that chance, for instance, being the only veteran in the race, having a proven conservative record, unlike most of his peers on the stage. And just and lastly, I'd say um, what you saw tonight in a lot of the, the chirping back and forth was really a battle for third place, a distant third place, but a battle for third place nonetheless. We couldn't be happier. He did not go after the former president when opportunities presented themselves, like on the January 6th question. Is that a deliberate strategic decision. I think tonight, look, tonight was a, a debate with eight um, folks on the stage here in Milwaukee. And if the former president decides to show up on the debate stage, maybe those debates will have a little more um, engagement between them. David, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Uh, there you have it, Chuck. Not the dynamic that a lot of folks were expecting. Right. The DeSantis campaign uh, pleased with, with his performance and the opportunity that he got tonight. And the other thing I'll say is a lot of this kind of reminded me of one of the earlier uh, Republican events without former President Trump, which mm -hmm. was the family leadership conference in Iowa, where, you know, he wasn't there. People talked about him a little bit, but ultimately wasn't as missed as folks expected, and I wonder if that might be a little bit of the takeaway that this was an opportunity for these candidates to showcase what a post-Trump political landscape could look like. And so far, the reviews that I'm getting from voters are pretty good, that they got to hear these candidates on the issues and not talking about the election, not talking about the former president's grievances, and that's a bit of a breath of fresh air yep. for folks. Well, look, we're going to, I think, be talking to some voters a little later in this hour, actual voters who watch the debate. With, uh, with us, and we'll go from there. Dasha, and before that, Garrett, thank you both. Let me break down what we saw tonight. I got a great panel with us. Joining me on set, Amy Walter, the editor and publisher of the Cook Political Report. Lonnie Chen, former Mitt Romney and Marco Rubio advisor, Stanford University Director of Domestic Policy Studies. And Daniel Plutka, the senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute and an NBC News contributor. And when I have Lonnie here, the single biggest Republican vote getter in 2022. Even more votes than Ron DeSantis. That is correct. And that is something that you will always have in, in that trophy case of yours. But I'm going to start with the guys. It's SOT 2. It's Nikki Haley, because Nikki Haley is the first candidate that actually started debating other candidates. Let's hear how it got started. No one is telling the American people the truth. The truth is that Biden didn't do this to us. Our Republicans did this to us, too. When they passed that $2.2 trillion COVID stimulus bill, they left us with 90 million people on Medicaid, 42 million people on food stamps. You have Ron DeSantis, you've got Tim Scott, you've got Mike Pence. They all voted to raise the debt. And Donald Trump added $8 trillion to our debt. And our kids are never going to forgive us for this. 
Amy Walter, that was about 14 minutes into the debate. When it, yeah. To me, that's, yeah. when, that's when the debate started. It's like, oh, okay, we're taking, yeah. we're, we're taking the gloves off. We can start name-checking candidates, and that's when it began. So give me your general takeaway uh, on what you think you saw. And I say well, think I'm because not, we're all— We're all sort of— yeah. We know that what we think— it's not necessarily, it's think. not important because what the voters think is important. I don't think any of us thought Donald true. Trump won a single debate in 2016. I, Last I, time in I fact, checked. I went back and I yeah. looked at <laughs> all of the press coming after that August debate in yeah. 2015. Everyone in the traditional media yeah. said Trump lost this. Oh, debate. it's going to be terrible. terrible. This terrible. is going to play terribly with That's the voters, right. right? Everybody hates Trump, but the voters. What I thought was really interesting about the Haley positioning tonight was it wasn't just that she was going after her uh, her Republican challengers in order to move herself up mm -hmm. within the Republican ranks. It's like she was going after independent voters on everything from, well, right there, mm -hmm. uh, going directly hey, at they Donald both Trump spending. on spending, yep. the establishment, but also on her answers on abortion, on climate, on Ukraine, were much more a much more aimed at getting that swing female voter than they were at trying to get at that sort of conservative Trump voter. Uh, to, to back it up, later in the debate at one point, she says, we have to face the fact that Trump is the most disliked politician in America. We can't win a general election that way. Uh, you know, it was interesting. It, it, we'll see if it, it, it helps, too, yeah. with a donor base that is probably more in line, a Republican right. donor base that's more in line with her views. Will they right. start to put their money behind her? Well, look, we started with Nikki Haley, but let's be honest, the candidate that yeah. got the most attention and drew the most everything was Vivek Ramaswamy. Uh, in some ways, he wanted that. This is exactly what he wanted, Danny. Um, it reminds me of Trump 2015. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It turned some people off, right, the way he, he does his thing. But it may light, some, it may light people up, too. Um, okay. I don't know those people. Uh, did you know I, the Trump acolytes at the time either? Maybe. I mean, I think people were much more, look, people prior to January, you know, 2021 were much more open to the idea of Donald Trump. And in 2016, people thought that he would even, even though he was a, an incendiary candidate, that he would revert to that kind of normalcy in the White House that a lot of us expected. Now, he, he didn't do that. But Vivek, no, uh, I'm sorry. You think it was too hot? I, was it too hot? I, I can't get past the fact that, you know, I just am not looking for another loudmouth putz. I, I feel exactly the way that every single other candidate on that stage felt about Vivek Ramaswamy. It is. Was, Shut up and go away. It, 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 yes. Yes. It felt like it was, you know, we, we talked about how during the first Democratic debate, when Pete Buttigieg was just taken off, there was a lot of, who the heck is this guy? And Amy Klobuchar went out. Yeah. This was that and then some. Yeah. Lonnie. I mean, look, like him or hate him, you had to listen to him. Yeah. And, and so I think he accomplished the goal probably that he came into tonight with, which was to present himself as a credible candidate. His and name ID was not that high. It was high among the super online and, and cable people. Yeah. But it wasn't the way a DeSantis is. We saw it in our own Iowa poll. He hasn't hit that next level yet. Maybe he does. Well, I, I, I'm not sure there is a next level. That's the thing. I think that there is a ceiling for him, and I think he probably hits that ceiling. Tonight probably helps him get there in some ways. And that ways. ceiling a chandelier somewhere in my life. <laughs> <laughs> right? I mean, it's the, he's the I, Trump I, surrogate. Right. But I think, yeah. I, think, I think that the, you know, I've been involved in preparing for, I don't know, 20 or 30 primary debates uh, in my life, and I think that you always come in with a set of goals. You always come in with a set of things you want to get accomplished. And if you're Vivek Ramaswamy, you've accomplished those things. Uh, I think Nikki Haley accomplished quite a bit tonight. I think she showed herself to be a what Amy just described of her is exactly what she wanted. A credible to her, general election candidate mm -hmm. who donors can go to if for some reason they're jittery about Ron DeSantis. And I think Ron DeSantis had a good night, too, because he came out of it unscathed. And if, nobody if went after him. Nobody went after him. I'm very surprised. I'm actually very surprised because here's the thing. If you're any of these other candidates, you want to be in the position he's in. And so I was struck by the fact that if, you know, I mean, I think Haley did her own thing. I thought, you know, Tim Scott was never going to go after DeSantis because that's not, his, that's not his persona, and I get that. But if, if you're any of these other candidates, you're competing for the space that Ron DeSantis sits in. So to me, it was a little bit confusing, and I think DeSantis' camp can claim victory because he came out of this essentially, I think, as well positioned, if not better positioned, than he was going into it. See, I don't agree with you. I was waiting for, for Ron DeSantis to be the candidate that everybody wanted Ron DeSantis to be, that guy who was going to get all those people who would otherwise have voted for Trump. 
Trump, plus would be getting all the people who are looking for somebody who's normal, who has a track record, who's a proven successful governor. I feel like everybody ignored him because he's the guy to ignore in the race. He hasn't done well enough. He hasn't let. He hasn't lived up to our expectations. I mean, we'll find out tomorrow. Uh, look, I do think there's a pretty important moment that took place at this debate. Let me do. Let's go all the way to SOC 15, guys. Even though this is just Pence and Ramaswamy in Ukraine, it also allows us to talk about. Um, we, we did in the open as well. But Ron DeSantis was the first guy to jump up and say he wasn't going to support Ukraine but, funding. This is. This is not an insignificant thing. If Trump, DeSantis, and right now Ramaswamy, the top three, are none of them are going to do it, it puts Ukraine as a general election type of issue. I know what we say about foreign policy, but it weirdly puts that in play, and I don't know if that's a good idea for them. And going back to what you all were talking about with how well did Ron DeSantis do, I don't know that I actually know his position on Ukraine. He was kind DeSantis, of— yeah, I have no idea what it is. But he, he went— he, he wants kind you to of believe, raised his hand, right. but he, he didn't really raise he his doesn't hand. doesn't want to spend more money. That's right. Yeah. So, yes, we need to spend more money. And he, there was a lot of, I'm going to take your question and then I'm going to pivot. I'm going to take your question and pivot, which is fine. It's what politicians do. But if you came into this debate thinking, I really want to know, like, who is Ron DeSantis? What is he going to do as president? I, I don't know that it came through. One sign that you're not in first place or second place or third place when you go to the spin room yourself. I want to dip in. I think we, we, uh, the former vice president is in the spin room. So let's take a listen. <laughs> this is governor of Indiana. And I was the leading champion of conservative values in the Trump Pence administration. I know how to fight. And I was happy to bring that how fight tonight. You're not doing well. When you're right yeah. Four years. All right. Anyway, I, I say that not to be disparaging. It's just a fact. I mean, you know, when candidates are going into the spin room, that's... It's either you're not in a good position yeah. or you've had a bad night. Right. Either way, <laughs> it, it isn't yeah. great. But on this foreign policy front, I mean, on DeSantis, he walked back that weird line he gave Tucker when, it was, when he called it a regional conflict of some sort or whatever. He, it does feel like he's read a polling memo on what the Republican electorate wants to hear on Ukraine, and he's trying to somehow say what they want to hear without committing to never funding you. No, I mean, look, this is what we, we were watching this, and I said uh, what I'm about to say again, which is I feel like Ron DeSantis, the Ron DeSantis that I think I know who governed Florida actually, and who was a Navy SEAL, uh, actually is pro-Ukraine, is pro-supporting Ukraine, but that he's positioning himself, that he's taking this position, that, and it, it feels so insincere and, obviously, so freaking out. wrong. Don't voters sniff that out? I, I, I don't know. I would uh, hope so. I'm not sure Republican primary voters much care one way or the other, to be honest with you on this. I, I, I just don't think this is a high... You think high, they only care because Trump tells them I, to care about it? It's not a high salience issue in this primary, right? I mean, you heard the high salience issues. It's it's the woke stuff. It's uh, some stuff maybe around the economy. Yeah. And it's Trump. I mean, we haven't yeah. talked about him. No. He was a winner tonight. I, by not even showing up, he was I, a winner I, I tonight. I think it, he looks he's smarter than ever not being involved in that debate. Uh, let's sneak in a break. We want to pay some bills. Amy, Lonnie, Daniel, you guys are sticking around. A lot more to get to, including the view from inside Trump world. I think they feel pretty good about what we all just said now. They've been listening in. The field's four times indicted frontrunner was notably absent from the stage tonight. But it didn't stop him from fighting for the spotlight. We'll talk to one of Trump's top campaign advisors next. You're watching a special edition. And perhaps the most direct attack on the former president during the debate tonight. Tonight's debate was at times surprisingly light on any focus on Trump, something his campaign perhaps had counted on. The former president appeared in a pre-recorded interview, part of a debate counter-programming strategy by his campaign. Joining me now, we have Vaughn Hilliard. He's in Atlanta, where the former president will be surrendering to authorities at the Fulton County Jail tomorrow. And Vaughn, oh, this was a choice. The former president could have done this last week, could have done it Monday or Tuesday before the debate. Not an accident that this is being happening at the end of the week after the debate, because I think what happens in Milwaukee, they hope stays in Milwaukee. Right. This posted on X, formerly known as Twitter, just five minutes before this GOP debate started. It was a 45 minute conversation between Tucker Carlson and Donald Trump. And he, right off the top of the interview, was asked why he was not partaking in the Fox debate. And Donald Trump said, 
Why would I do that when I'm up by 50, 60 percentage points? And why would I stand there on a stage for one to two hours only to be harassed by others, including several who were at zero, one or two percent in polls? Uh, and he openly suggested that the likes of Asa Hutchinson, Chris Christie, they should drop out of the race completely. He suggested that Florida Governor Ron DeSantis was gonzos in his wor wor own words. And he directly talked about the uh, now four indictments that he has faced over the course of these last four months, calling them BS. Of course, he will be right where I'm standing here outside of the Fulton County Jail uh, come tomorrow evening. And for Donald Trump, I'll let you listen to part of uh, the exchange that he had with Carlson, in which Carlson asked him multiple times about threats of violence in the country, a potential civil war, and what he thinks about uh, the possibility of open conflict uh, heading into 2024. Take a listen. So do you think it's possible that there's open conflict? We seem to be moving I, I don't towards know. something. I don't know, because I don't know what it, you know, I, I can say this. Uh, there's a level of passion that I've never seen. There's a level of hatred that I've never seen. And that's probably a bad combination. For the amount uh, in which the Republican candidates on that stage in Milwaukee went after one another, Chuck, tonight, Donald mm -hmm. Trump's uh, exchanges with Tucker Carlson very much felt like a, a whole different campaign or a different race, if I may. It's a striking thing that there was no denouncement of any violence, right? There was no, did he, I, we, we just played a clip there, but I'm just curious. He didn't say, but I'm going to do everything I can to make sure to tamp down any violence, to tamp down this behavior. Was there any of that? No, that's, no, that's right. And I think that we should be clear that we have heard this from the folks uh, on the ground who have suggested that if Donald Trump were to be put into jail or lose the 2024 mm -hmm. election, that they would see this going to a dangerous place. A woman just told me this week earlier this week in Iowa that she, in her own words, thought the civil war was imminent here. I think we're at a very difficult point uh, right. for this country. And Donald Trump, as you heard, did not explicitly say that civil war is not imminent. And, uh, uh, and I, 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 I uh, you know, for the leading GOP contender here on right. uh, the Republican side, uh, you know, it's, it's hard not to see who a brought, difficult 2024 I, ahead. Knowing Vaughn, that we who brought well this up? The, yeah. Did Tucker introduce this idea? This is Tucker. Did Tucker Carlson introduce yeah, this, this idea? Carlson and I, so he's kind of cheering it on? Did Tucker Carlson. I mean, I'm, I'm confused by him. I know right, he's he kind actually, of a, he's a propagandist. So what, what was he trying to do here? Right. And it was actually Donald Trump, within the first few minutes of the interview, uh, was asked over the course of about two minutes about what he thought about the death of Jeffrey Epstein, which uh, mm -hmm. the, the government has deemed that he died by suicide. And after mm -hmm. about two months, two minutes of uh, of Tucker asking Trump about this and Trump seemingly confused and even saying himself that he thought it was, in fact, a suicide. Uh, Tucker tried to correlate that by saying, well, could potentially be they be trying to kill you, kill you next was his mm -hmm. inference there. And uh, I, and I know I would be interested in the words of your next guest here, because for Donald Trump, it was, uh, you know, it was uh uh, it was quite the correlation that Tucker Carlson seemed to be making. And I don't think Tucker Carlson is wrong to be talking about the prospect of a potential civil war and open conflict, because we hear that from folks on the ground. At the same time, it's one that clearly the former president mm -hmm. uh, is having some difficulty wrestling with. And as somebody who just had a fundraiser uh, last night for January 6th defendants, mm -hmm. I think it's an important question for the former president to uh, continue to face uh, about the prospect of violence in the country. All right, Vaughn Hilliard uh, on the ground force in Atlanta. Vaughn, thank you. Well, joining me now is a senior advisor to the Trump campaign, Jason Miller. And Jason, I want to ask you about the debate, but I want to ask you about this questioning from Tucker Carlson, I guess, sort of talking up the idea of a violent, some sort of violent conflict over this campaign. Is that something the, the former president is embracing? I, I that answer there was an odd answer, and I just didn't know if you had a better understanding. No, Chuck, I think you're framing it incorrectly. President Trump had a very good answer. Well, let's talk about the debate for a moment. The fact well, of the I matter is question. President Trump won Th this thing tonight, Chuck. Is he going to tonight, tamp down it's violence, Jason? No, 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 no. Is he going to 
Not, Chuck, I mean, is he going to Chuck, convince his... Chuck, Chuck, that I'm is... I'm just trying to... Chuck, I'm, I'm confused that's an idiot. Chuck, respectfully, respectfully, that's an idiotic question uh, to even go in. Uh, President Trump is campaigning on making America great again. We saw the greatest economy that we've had in a century, possibly ever, when President Trump was in office. He makes it very clear. He has more policy videos on his website. He gives speeches. He gives detailed interviews. He takes on the tough battles with tough reporters. He's actually doing it. And so President Trump, you saw tonight... His policies loom large over everybody on that stage. Mm -hmm. He dominated every answer, whether it was about him politically or policy-wise. And I, quite frankly, I agree with the comments earlier. President Trump looked like a genius by skipping the pig pile mm -hmm. tonight and instead doing the interview with Tucker Carlson, which, by the way, Chuck, just hit 87 million views. So what, probably 10, a little more than tenfold, than watch mm -hmm. the rest of the folks have their cat fight tonight. But here's the other thing, I think a really important point. I heard someone earlier on the panel say they thought that sanctimonious did okay. Uh, that's not right. We saw the death of Ron DeSantis' campaign tonight as Vivek Ramaswamy leapfrog him into mm -hmm. second place. DeSantis, it didn't do good enough for him to tread water. He had to have a breakout moment, and Ramaswamy completely outshone him. I knew President Trump wasn't going to be there tonight. I didn't know Ron DeSantis was going to skip the debate as well. Is Donald Trump planning on being in any debates if or only if the polls get closer? Good question. He said on True Social that he's not planning on being in the debates, plural, and I would take him at that until possibly he decides to change his mind. Maybe it has something to do with the poll numbers. Maybe it's because he wants to get in there and mix it up. Maybe it's because he saw debates like this evening where none of the other candidates had breakout moments or really seemed to have any strong policy ideas. And President Trump's the one that has everything, whether it's bringing down inflation, stopping the killing in Ukraine. His presence really loomed large over everyone tonight. I am curious, let me ask you about that Ukraine question. Is Donald Trump, what is his stance on more funding, more aid for Ukraine? Does he want more aid? Because there's an assumption that he doesn't want more aid to Ukraine, but I don't want to put words in his mouth. Where is he on this? Well, and President Trump has been very clear on that. He said that his goal on this is to go and stop the killing. He has messages that he can deliver to Zelensky. He has messages that he can deliver to Putin. He's not going to go and have a debate on this over, say, cable news. That would be silly. He's going to go and has the relationships with both of these mm -hmm. leaders to get it to stop. These are relationships that none of the other candidates have because they haven't done it on this level. That's why so much of what we saw tonight really seemed kind of an audition for President Trump's cabinet in many senses. But he's the the only one who's actually done this. And that's why I think you're going to see him having a big boost in the polls coming out of this. I do think Ramaswamy is going to have a nice bump. I think DeSantis is finished. Are you guys, you, you did a fundraiser with January 6th, folks. Do you view January 6th as an asset for the general election? I think uh, that's not going to be the primary determinative issue in this election. I think it's going to be about the economy. I think it's going to be about inflation, Biden's terrible record. I mean, Chuck, you're a student of politics. You saw where Biden and the Democrats just went up with a $25 million ad buy in a whole bunch of states. They're supposedly safe blue states because Biden's freaking out. He sees his numbers plummeting with African-American voters, with Hispanic American voters, because they're mad at the inflation. Mm -hmm. All the Biden geniuses say, wait a minute, inflation is starting to come down. Guys, everything is still getting more expensive. Maybe it's getting more expensive a little bit slower, but folks' wages aren't keeping up. That's why the Biden White House is but, in a panic. And by the way, believe, the embrace, you don't the, believe the embrace January 6th of Bidenomics is a negative? Was, you don't believe it's a negative for Donald Trump to I, win I, I, re-election? I don't think that it's going to be a determinative issue in this election. I think it's about the economy, Biden's failed record versus President Trump's successful record, particularly on the economy, crime, immigration. We talk about the border and, again, stopping the killing in Ukraine. Jason Miller at the uh, debate spin room. I guess Fox finally let you in. Did you get your credential or are you there you somewhere else? Hey, Chuck, you can't stop the Trump train. Okay. Fox tried and couldn't keep you out. Jason Miller uh, in the spin room <laughs> that Trump people weren't supposed to get credentials for. Thank you. Coming up, the battle for battleground Wisconsin. We're on the ground talking with a key group of voters in Wisconsin for their reaction to the Republican field's first debate performance. Don't go anywhere. Special edition of Meet the Press.
welcome back. We've been talking all hour about how we all think each of the Republican primary candidates performed in tonight's debate, but it is in our opinion or the opinions uh, of other pundits that matter here. It's the voters that will be voting on caucus night or primary night in their state. So let's hear from them. In this case, it's Wisconsin voters. Our own Shaquille Brewster is live with self-described conservative voters at a watch party in Waukesha, Wisconsin. We always care about one of the wow counties uh, around our favorite exactly. swing voting area in swing state in America. And I'll tell you this, one of the lessons from uh, 2016, Shaq, is what the pundit said and what the voters said were two different things. So tell us what the voters said. <laughs> It could be two very different things, Chuck. And let me just set this up because we're doing something a little bit different. We're in the living room of a family here in Waukesha. You know Waukesha, a Republican stronghold. These mm -hmm. are self-described conservative voters. Uh, and I want to introduce you to them. We had some food. We had some drinks. Acceptable amount. But I want to introduce them to you. And let's just start with these are all folks who voted for former President Trump twice. So they're coming into this having voted for the former president, I want to just start out with the question, just a quick show of hands. For any of you, did this debate change your support, make you more interested? Raise your hand if it made you more interested in another candidate. I just can't say. No one. Who surprised you? Who impressed you tonight, Bob? Scott. Tim Scott. Tim Scott. What about Tim Scott surprised you? He was, he, he was sound like he was talking without... Uh, a program he had as he felt natural to me and he was giving me the answers and talking about things that I think we need to talk about. You told me earlier he's now one of your top candidates. That yes, you're looking at. yes, yes. How does he compare to former President Trump? He'd be a good running mate. You see him as a running mate after that performance? Yes. Ms. Donna? I feel the same way. Tim Scott is your yes, top? Yes, sure. He would be a good ticket with President Trump. Who didn't you know about before? that you like tonight? That that young man, Vivek. Ramaswamy. Yes, he's uh, very, he speaks very well, and he's t he tells the people what they really want to say. He, I just think he's really good, but he's awfully young <laughs> and inexperienced. You yeah. feel like he's too inexperienced? Uh, probably, yes. He hasn't had, a, he hasn't been around very long, has he? Because I haven't really heard of him. So... Ms. Stacy, you mentioned that you started out in the beginning liking Nikki Haley. I saw you clapping at one point, but that shifted for you. What changed? Um, she came off in the middle sort of angry, and she also was very much, um, her foreign policy is not something I agree with at all. So that changed my mind right then and there. Um, Why was Ukraine so animating? That was something that everyone stepped in on. Um, I think that Ukraine is just as bad as... Um, Russia. I don't think that um, I don't think that uh, Zelensky is a, uh, is a saint at all. And I think that we are paying the debt of the Biden crime family to Ukraine. And that's what we're doing. And I don't believe that I would take any of those people over what we have right now in the White House. I think any of them could do a, a better job. Um, but if I had to say the winners of tonight, I would say um, DeSantis, I would say Bergen, uh, Vivek, and Tim Scott. And you didn't know Bergen before. I did not know him, but he came off very articulate. He came off very calm. Um, I was very impressed with him, and um, he interested me. Mike, you told me you never, or I don't know never, but you usually don't watch debates. Never. But you did this time. What did you think? What did, who impressed you? Uh, Vivek. Ramaswamy, why? Of course. I... Um, he says what the Americans are basically thinking as well. But you said that you also are coming and supporting Trump? 100 percent, regardless. Has that changed at all? It has not changed. Why not? Uh, his experience, four years, former president. Um, I just think that we need him back as a country. When you... You invited us all here. <laughs> you, well, you I, I, I sort up. of did. I sort of did. Yes. Mm -hmm. Any of those candidates, uh, you, you mentioned you not liking some of them, that you heard them for the first time and you backed away. Who and why? Uh, Mike Pence just needs to go away. Um, I'm, I'm tired of seeing Trump Pence, signs, Trump Pence signs as I drive down the road. I just want to see Trump and anybody else besides Mike Pence. Um, 
Chris Christie actually, you know, he gets a bad rap. I thought he did a pretty good job tonight, to be honest. And you told me no. You said Chris Christie. You mentioned him when we walked in. You said anyone but Chris Christie. I did. I did. What, what changed about Chris Christie for you? As someone who loves former well, he's Trump. A, he's, a, he's, he's the Trump basher. He's always been a Trump basher. And um, I just thought he spoke well and had, had good messaging. I want to go back to Ms. Donna. Okay. You said uh, when we were talking earlier, not only was it Ukraine that stuck out for you, but it was just the foreign policy. That was something that was a message that you was animating for you. Why was that? Um, I just think that we shouldn't be giving all that money to Ukraine when our southern border needs it. The whole United States needs that money. Why not help our country first? That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you all for yes. talking with me and lending it's us been, in your house. It's been a pleasure. We got one I know question you said it was past your group. bedtime, so we're going to get Shannon. out of here. No, no, very no, quickly. Has one question for you. I'm going to repeat it for sure. you. Okay. Yeah. Jordan Love. How do we feel about Jordan Love? All right. Very important question. Most important question of the night. How do we feel about Jordan Love? Ah. Really? Ah. ah. <laughs> well, I watched, I think, one series, and... I, I think he has potential to do well. There you go. Chuck? It's the most important punditry of the night. <laughs> That's what I wanted to hear. That's the one thing. we uh, Forget the red, white, and blue. It's green and gold in that house, I hope. <laughs> right? He said forget the red, white, and blue. It's green and gold. Absolutely. <laughs> Thanks, Chuck. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Shaq, great stuff. Just Jordan terrific. Daniel. Thanks very much. Shaquille Brewster in Waukesha. And as we mentioned, tonight's debate was an opportunity for some of the top Republican hopefuls to introduce themselves to the American public. And while they're making their pitch for the nomination, some of what they may say may have been a bit misleading or over-exaggerated. Ms. Hallie Jackson is here, our senior You're Washington correspondent. not going to talk about sports, are you? not going to make okay, you talk I, about I, sports. I, I, She's, of course, a uh, host of Hallie <laughs> Jackson now, my favorite person to hand the baton to okay. off that I've ever handed the baton to. Um, how... Uh, how over exaggerating was this debate? It's a debate. I expected it's, a lot. That's right. But. I mean, listen, pe people have their messages. They have their takes that they want to get out there on some issues that, like, listen, are really important to voters and are going to be really important beyond, you know, this election. Things like foreign policy, things like the economy. Yeah. You know, Chuck, that that is a huge driving force for people. Let me play something that Tim Scott talked about as it relates to an attack that we will probably see from conservatives against President Biden for the next year and a half of our lives. Watch. What we also need to understand is that Joe Biden's Bidenomics has led to the loss of $10,000 of spending power for the average family. When you see 16% inflation, your gas is up 40%, your food is up 20%, your electricity is up 20%. We can stop that by turning the spigot off in Washington, sending the money back to the states and allowing the decisions to be made at their own houses. All right, so let's talk sort of where the facts, where the numbers, where the yeah. figures are here, right? Inflation matters to people. We know that's a big driver. It hit a 40-year high last summer mm -hmm. of about 9%. It is down now 3.2%. It's lower than it was. It's still higher than what the Fed wants to see, which is why they've kept raising interest rates. It does mean that the mortgage rate, which you heard about, is up to 7.5%. That's the highest it's been in 20 years. Overall national debt, uh, $33 trillion. You heard Nikki Haley talk about the economy from the Trump perspective, pointing out that Donald Trump... Under his administration, added eight trillion to the national debt. That's true. It was seven point eight trillion. Which something the team Biden so jumped on, by the way. Both Scott and Haley were basically accurate. Well, some of the yeah, some of the, 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 the Scott numbers were a little bit tweaked, but generally, right? right like inflation is now down more right. than it was a year ago, and Donald Trump but did it's still add, higher than it was, which is what he was saying. Yeah, yeah, right. right. Yeah. But, but Donald Trump did add eight trillion to the debt. There's also um, foreign policy, which foreign is something policy. you were interested. This in. This was interesting because it really, first of all, I just loved it because it. It actually created a debate on substance. You know, there was different. There was certainly different agreements. But what did on the fact check part? Of it, what did you? Uh, um, I know that the comment from Nikki Haley got some attention here, talking about Vivek Ramaswamy. Uh, you heard it was so interesting to hear Shaq and those voters in the room. Definitely. One of them saying, "Hey, I think he's kind of inexperienced. I like him, but he's young." And Nikki Haley went after him on this issue as it relates to foreign policy. Let me play that. Ukraine is the first line of defense for us. And the problem that Vivek doesn't understand is he wants to hand Ukraine to Russia. He wants to let China eat Taiwan. He wants to go and stop funding Israel. You don't False. do that to friends. What you do False. instead is you have the backs of your friends. Ukraine is a front line of defense.
So what would Vivek Ramaswamy want to actually do? What has he said before? Let's take it just piece by piece. On Israel, he had said that he would negotiate new, detail, new deals rather in the Middle East to make it so that U.S. aid would not be needed for Israel after 2028. He wants to pull back U.S. After 2028. Yeah, yeah he yeah. said that. I mean, he's on the record with it. Ukraine, you saw him on the debate stage. He's been very consistent on that. He has said that you, the U.S. has no national interest in the Ukraine war. And then on Taiwan, this is interesting. He said that he believes that we should um, rethink our military commitment to defend Taiwan once the U.S. gets semiconductor independence, which he says will happen in his first term. Yeah, I think he said, if we're not ready, then yes, we'll military defend Taiwan. But if we have a superconductor industry, right. we'll walk away. Yeah. Fascinating. Fascinating there. And we were, uh, one quick one on Governor DeSantis. COVID lockdowns. Yes. Um, he talked about that. I won't play the soundbite here, but he talked about Florida leading the way out of lockdowns. Um, you know this. You know Florida well, Chuck. Mm -hmm. there, there was a lockdown in Florida. It was fully lifted five months later. Um, Florida ended up having in 2021 the 18th highest death rate in the country. But schools, as he talked about, too, reopened. It was one of the first 10 states to have mandated the option for in-person full-time learning. All right. Be honest. When you heard our little focus group, what did it, isn't it fascinating? I, I just, I thought, you know, it's good to remind yeah. ourselves that, hey, voter, uh, different people take different things away from a debate. And that's what you have to remind ourselves. Love that segment. Loved your segment, too. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. We're going to have more on the state of the Republican primary race and the race for the White House after a quick break. You're watching Meet the Press now. I think the difference is you might have some others like you may have on the stage. It's morning in America speech. It is not morning in America. We live in a dark moment and we have to confront the fact that we're in an internal sort of cold cultural civil you war. And we have to recognize that people with the failed win. government. Look, the violence, the idea that we might be in violence with the Tucker Carlson, Donald Trump, he's talking about a cold civil war. I'll tell you what grabbed me from the focus group, though, Lonnie, because it fed into something you and I were talking about during the debate. And, I, and it was like when, the, when two of those folks said, you know, Vivek says what I wanted to hear. Give the people what they boy, want. Some for, form of that. And I'm like going, boy, that's exactly what people used to say about Donald Trump in 16. Yeah. I mean, look, he, he came in tonight. He wanted to appear as though he belonged there. And he said what he needed to say. And people sort of nod along. And I called it like, it's like chicken tenders and mac and cheese, right? You never go wrong. Give them what they want. Give what they want. A 12-year-old, sure. and they're always going to say, or a, or you're a, the best cook. Or a 45-year-old. I know, right. You, you really... <laughs> there's learned no, something now. There is no downside to mac and cheese <laughs> no. or chicken tenders. I, it, it, look, he is going to have a moment now. The question is, is it a Herman Cain moment, or is it something more sustainable? Well, I, I don't get who he's talking to. People who don't want Donald Trump aren't going to want a more tan, younger, shinier teeth Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. And the people who want Donald Trump have Donald Trump. Who exactly is he speaking to? For me, he feels like when I but mistakenly turn on TV late at night and there's somebody selling me something I really don't want really he's speaking, fast. He's speaking to Donald Trump. That's who he's speaking to. Well, so, and what's Donald going to do? Make him vice president? Well, you know. He, and yet, Amy, I, I look, I'm not trying to, to, to poo-poo this, what you guys are saying, but there was a lot of dismissiveness of Donald Trump at this oh, point I, in time after the first debate. Absolutely. I think the most telling thing from that family room mm -hmm. in Wisconsin was, did any of this debate, did this make you change your mind about Donald Trump? Absolutely not. Oh, this person's interesting. It's a little bit going to the menu. It's a little bit like saying, these look interesting, but I'm always going to go back to the chicken tenders. Like, in fact, maybe I would order that one time. Right. But mm -hmm. at the end of the day, I'm going to go back. Yeah. Right. I'm going to go back to, to what this is. So, and nobody was talking about, and more important, no one's talking about Ron DeSantis. Well, and tomorrow he gets and, indicted, or arraigned. Yeah. I'm sorry, he gets not arraigned Ron. tomorrow. He's already been. No, I'm Trump, talking about yeah, Trump. 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 Right. And Unless there's something you know that we don't know. <laughs> You're right. It's, it just sort of steps on everything else. But no, but I think I think the point is That's that everybody has already absorbed that information. They've they've written people who love him have written it off. It's yeah. illegitimate. The weaponization of the Department of Justice and everybody else is kind of looking at it and going, it's "How good. do I stand out?" It's the devil, you know. Let me play because the, the moment that so. the moment that we may see a lot down the road, right, in a general election is, did Mike Pence do the right thing? Here was the interesting little uh, mash that we put together on that. Bird's eye chicken dippers, for chicken worth dipping. Do you believe 
that Mike Pence did the right thing, Senator Scott. Do you believe he did the right thing? Absolutely. Mike did his duty. I got no beef with him. But here's the thing. Is this <laughs> what we're going to be focusing on? Mike Pence stood for the Constitution. I do think that Vice President Pence did the right thing, and I do think that we need to give him credit for that. Happy to answer the question. Mike Pence did the right thing on January 6th. Okay. Does that matter? How is that even a question? I mean, I, it, it's just, it just tells you where we're, question, at. where we're at. question where we're at? I mean, it's just where we're at, right? But I mean, I think that um, it, it's just a remarkable statement about the 2024 election. And, and again, the subtext to all of this is Donald Trump. I mean, Donald Trump wasn't there tonight, but subtext. he was loomed. He was <laughs> <laughs> the subtext in the, the forward yeah. and, the, and every chapter. But isn't it interesting that, that Ron DeSantis said something that I think really is resonant for a lot of people, even people who like Donald Trump, which is, let's stop talking about the past. Let's talk about the future. And yet, even that didn't, separate him out. It didn't elevate It was him. oddly his best moment. Yes. But it also showcased his not his best foot forward sometimes. He was like, oh, like the annoyed guy. And I don't know if that's... Right, versus the yeah. optimistic, like, Tim that Scott. happened. Yeah. Let's put it in the rear view. I'm looking up for you and you mm -hmm. and you. That's what I'm going to do did think instead it was of getting in, caught in the past. In the focus group that they identified Tim Scott as somebody. A couple of the voters identified Tim Scott. And, and I do think that there is something about him. You know, he's going to hang around the hoop. Yes, he is. He's going to hang around the hoop. Yes, he's going to be a sports analogy. Yeah. Hang around the hoop. And he'll be there. Too. He'll Don't be tell there. Him. He'll, tell me. He'll, yeah, yeah, he'll yeah. be there until until someone's not, right? And and that's not a horrible strategy. Look, he has the like money this. to he's do He's got this. the money, yep. the organization. That's an important thing. Um, and let's read. This is the first time exactly. he has ever debated. Well, and it's and, got and a long, I wouldn't have, long, long way to go. That said, if you didn't know that, you wouldn't have known that tonight. No, oh, he came across yeah. also as... I thought as, he did a good job. As, no, he came across as un, not canned, which I think was nice. He spoke... You know, in the beginning, he sort of wondered whether he was going to be smooth enough, whether he really was on his game. But afterwards, he actually came across as much more genuine than the other guys, even people who I agreed with. So the next debate is going to include everybody up there but Asa Hutchinson and we don't know on Bergam. Because everybody else is qualified already for the next debate. What changes? If that's the same basic lineup, what changes in the second debate here? The men are going to wear blue ties. <laughs> <laughs> they were all, it was Pence, DeSantis, and Ramaswamy all went with the red uh, and the white shirt. Yeah, and the American flag. Right. I, I have a tough time seeing another debate where Ron DeSantis does not, is not the focus of attention. If the polls remain where they are. I don't think that Ron DeSantis is going to get another night like he had tonight in terms of the other candidates. It seemed like a lot of wasted on time on Vivek. Yeah, well, but he was in the center of the stage. So No, I, I understand that, but by the other candidates. I, I don't know whether, like, you don't get that time back. You and mean Vivek, as, the, as the other candidates? Yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, that's well, not the guy you're chasing. Well, trying to figure out, which is, was this because they do see him as a threat? Or because they really, everything he says and everything he stands for just gets them at their core. Well, he's core. Trump. No, I, isn't it no, that he's no, Trump without the personality Trump, of Trump? Even, yeah. Well, that's the thing. It's yeah. even more so that he's the 38-year-old who thinks that he knows more. Right? What, is it 38? Yeah. yeah. He that wouldn't be eligible to run for president he, at 28. If, no, no, no. Right. Uh, that he thinks he knows more than anybody else on the stage. So uh, more annoyance or more strategic. But I think it was much more strategic, which is we need to get this guy out. Well, I don't know if, I don't know if they if got him out. I was just going to say, I have a feeling he is going to have a big social media presence after tonight. Yep. Um, you guys were a lot of fun to watch the debate with. You're my debate partners the rest of the campaign season. And thank you all for being with us this hour. We appreciate it. We'll have more news and analysis tomorrow and every weekday at 4 p.m. Eastern on Meet the Press. Now, this has been a Meet the Press special for the first Republican presidential debate. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.